Good afternoon, and thank you to the International Authors Forum and to everyone at the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva. I am John Deegan. As mentioned, I am the Executive Director of the Writers' Union of Canada. I came to the Union from a role in public funding, in which I administered all of the arts grants for writers, publishers, and literary presentations in the Canadian province of Ontario. I also happen to be a novelist myself, a poet, and a working freelance writer. I regularly present on writing and publishing, and on the increasingly crazy idea of a career in the arts at libraries, elementary schools, colleges, and universities across Canada. So for me, the issues we're talking about at these meetings in Geneva are not at all abstract concepts. Copyright, how it interacts with my fellow writers and with me, what it means for libraries, archives, and educators, and what it means for my readers. These are the foundational relationships in my own ability to be a professional writer, to continue to create professional work. So likely you will have heard of the recent changes to Canadian copyright law, but I'm not sure you've been made aware of the immediate and potentially long-term impacts of those changes. So quickly then, Bill C-11, also known as Canada's Copyright Modernization Act, came into force in November 2012. Now the last change to the Copyright Act of Canada before C-11 happened 15 years earlier and obviously did not take into account any of the digital changes to how we made and consumed creative content between 97 and 2012. So, uh, in other words, our last tweak to copyright happened in 1997, the same year Google.com was registered as a domain name by a couple of unknown Stanford buddies working out of their garage. Now, why did it take 15 years for Canada to address digital content and the growing power of the internet? Well, It was not for lack of trying. Three different bills were introduced by three different governments before C-11 made its way through all the various legislative stages in Canada. Each of those three bills died when their sponsoring governments also died, killed off by election calls. I watched all of that legislative struggle myself. I was an active lobbyist on behalf of writers and publishers during those times. And in my opinion, each earlier bill was somewhat flawed, but would have passed easily, were it not for a growing online movement in Canada that tended to view any tinkering with copyright for digital purposes as a threat to computer technology, to the internet, in fact, to our very freedom. So you can see here, attempts at copyright reform in Canada have variously been called the Canadian DMCA. Oh, and just quickly, for perspective, in order to gather uninformed populist opposition for just about anything in Canada, it's always smart to label the hated thing American in some way. Thus, a Canadian new law is just the American law with a Canadian flag on top of it. Apologies to American colleagues in the crowd. It's certainly not a practice I endorse, but it is something we butt up against an awful lot in this particular file in Canada. So our new laws are also the Canadian SOPA, which is the U.S. Stop Online Piracy Act, and will, as you can see, somehow tape all of our mouths with Canadian government stickers and stop us from expressing ourselves. Lock imagery was also very popular, especially around the idea of technological protection measures and digital rights management. I hope you... You all can hear the exasperation in my voice all the way across the ocean because not only did writers and publishers know that changes to our law were not going to have any of these disastrous effects on us, we also knew that these non-issues were distracting everyone from the real issue, which was a focus on broad, new, and poorly defined exceptions to copyright. Copyright was not about to be maniacally strengthened, as in the popular narrative. It was about to be weakened weakened in certain very important areas, and in fact weakened to the point of economic irrelevance. So you see here the main change to Canada's Copyright Act, words added to our fair dealing exception. So section 29 of our act now reads, fair dealing for the purposes of research, private study, education, parody, or satire does not infringe copyright. So the three words, education, parody, and satire were added as new categories of fair dealing. Now, for Canadian writers, neither parody nor satire were of particular concern, as we've generally always respected these as follow-on forms of creativity. Importantly, they are also not industrial areas of copying for us. 
The word education, however, started the alarm bells ringing. Since the invention of the photocopier, writers and publishers in Canada and around the world, obviously, have struggled to recoup financial losses generated by rampant copying in educational settings. For more than two decades now, because we fought and worked to be able to do so, we have been successfully licensing our work for copying in educational course packs and reading packages, and in that way, teachers can pick and choose readings from across many books and journals, copy them freely, distribute them widely, and importantly, writers and publishers are somewhat compensated for the loss of book sales through license royalties. Now, the highest real number this has ever cost Canadian educators is calculated at $26 per student. So let's be clear about this. $26 per student, and that's for a year's worth of photocopying. Literally, hundreds of millions of pages of photocopying. One single book of far fewer pages would likely cost more than $26. And instead, students were getting a year's worth of reading, many, 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 many books, in fact, in all subjects, for that amount or less. That is what we call a bargain. On this slide, here's a photo of me testifying before the Senate of Canada days before C-11 passed, asking, uh, begging, in fact, for some clarification about what fair dealing for education would mean to our carefully constructed collective licensing system. What the photo does not show is that seated beside me is legal counsel for the Council of Ministers of Education in Canada, those who were lobbying hardest for what they hoped would be an educational exception. Now, in her testimony on that day, counsel for CMEC assured the Senate that there would be no economic impact on authors and publishers. I quote, There are no savings for ministers of education or ministries or school boards. She suggested that school boards, universities, and colleges would continue to spend as much as they always have on educational materials, and that all we were talking about was just ease of digital access. So has that happened? Of course it hasn't. As soon as the law was passed, school boards, universities, and colleges instituted new copying policies based on what they saw as a broadly expanding free territory. You can see here where you used to require a paid license to copy anywhere near 10% of a published work, schools are now claiming fully 10% for free. Entire chapters of books, entire short stories. Imagine a 450-page book. 45 pages is now considered a short excerpt according to these copying policies. That is the working reality in Canada today. And here's the immediate economic impact. Close to $8 million for writers alone, over $40 million for Canadian publishers, vanished in the blink of an eye. That is real money we received for the use of our work before C-11. We no longer receive it. Now, has the money just shifted to direct licensing and sales, as educational lobbying has suggested? Of course it hasn't. This is an article from the Canadian trade publication for the publishing industry, Quill & Quire. They investigated the real numbers in the last two years, and here we are. Oxford University Press Canada shutting down their school's division of publishing after successive losses they attribute directly to C-11. Jobs lost for writers, jobs lost for publishers, no measurable increase in direct sales or licenses between schools and publishers. Now, writers and publishers simply can't afford to take this change lying down. The Writers' Union of Canada held a protest at the University of Toronto last January on an extremely cold day, where we handed out free photocopies of my very own master's degree from the University of Toronto. The point being, if they were going to be distributing our work for free, perhaps we should be doing the same with their work. Now, when we moved inside the university library, we were removed by uniformed security. And of course, this one word change to our law has sent us all to court. Access Copyright, prompted by its writer and publisher members, is suing one of the largest and wealthiest universities in Canada, York University in Toronto, claiming their new fair dealing guidelines actually encourage copyright infringement. This will take years to resolve and will cost us all a great deal of money in legal fees. Not to mention, do we really want all of these issues decided in court? Or do we want to come to a respectful agreement? 
It's fair to say, I believe, and without any prejudice toward any of my Canadian colleagues in the room in Geneva at the moment, that copyright in Canada was in fact not modernized by a single-minded focus on limitations and exceptions, no matter the very good intentions of the legislators. My hope is that internationally, we do not make the same mistakes. Thank you.